How yes. long does it record for? Oh, this one will do two hours. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess we, uh, I got interested in science originally uh, mostly in terms of physics. I was in high school and then uh, took my uh, bachelor's degree in physics at the University of Birmingham. So I guess I went there around 1945 and then uh, left the university then <coughs> with a physics degree, a physics honors degree, and went to uh, Kodak for a while, then I went to British Ceramic Research Association in Stoke-on-Trent, which is where I grew up in the UK. <coughs> And then I got interested in research, and I got interested in, uh, found some papers by uh, a gentleman called Bangham, and uh, he'd done work in the, th I guess, let me see, late 30s, I guess, with uh, charcoal. And the reason I got interested in it, because this was related to a problem in the, in the pottery industry, where <clears throat> if there's cracks in the glaze, the water gets into the body, and uh, that uh, ends up by cracking the glaze because you get a microscopic expansion. So uh, basically what I did is uh, uh, I got interested in the project and I knew about Paul. I, I guess I found out, I forgot in the house, somehow about, found out about Paul's last. <clears throat> so I designed an interferometer to um, measure the uh, expansion of Paul's last when things were dull because Bangham was using various forms of charcoal at that time, and I guess and almost still since, my opinion is charcoal is an almost totally ill-defined substance. So I was interested in using porous glass and absorb something which definitely would not chemisorb because they were using, I can't remember what they used on the charcoal, but probably alcohols and water and things like that. So what I wanted to do was to uh, absorb argon on porous glass, of course, which had to I mean you had to be down at 77 Kelvin. And, uh, and see if uh, the porous glass expanded when you clearly only have physical absorption. So after, so I wrote to the College Science Department at Cambridge, and the professor there put me on to Jack Schulman, who was a mostly, uh, well, he did a lot of langrio blodgett work and also uh, flotation work. So he was interested in the liquid solid interface, but he'd never really done any gas solid interface, so the first when I went there he wanted me to work on the surface tension of cadmium, which I did for a while. Then he let me uh, build the, the apparatus I'd originally proposed, so that's how I got my, that was basically my PhD work. So that was involving the, uh, initially with the noble gases, argon specifically, originally, and then it was very interesting because the argon expansion was basically a straight line going through the origin. The expansion is a function of coverage up to a monolayer. <coughs> and the same with oxygen. But it was quite interesting because as soon as you change to nitrogen, the, uh, it wasn't a straight line at the origin. It sort of was slow to go up. And then we've got somewhat more complex molecules, all hell broke loose in a hurry. You dissolve carbon monoxide and it contracted before it expanded. And the theory of this, in very short terms, was that, uh, which in fact I worked out a modified theory of the one Bangham had used. Not he worked a theory based on Young's modulus, and I worked on one based on the <coughs> Bolt modulus. And basically, if you just consider, the porous glass has about a couple of hundred square meters per gram. So if you just consider porous glass as an assemblage of likely centered spheres, <coughs> then basically. Uh, the spheres all in vacuum under internal stress of uh, 2 gamma over R, and R is pretty small, and gamma is about 1,000, so that's a hell of a lot of internal stress. So if you decrease the surface tension by absorbing anything at the interface, you should relieve the stress and increase the radius, and that's, of course, the mechanism of what happened. Then when we, uh, which, of course, is basically in line with what Bangor had got, then when we, uh, went to other molecules, as I say, carbon monoxide was strange because it, uh, well, we're using mercury green light, so five centimeter piece contracted about three fringes of mercury green light before it finally expanded with carbon monoxide. 
But when I went to ammonia, all hell broke loose. The thing contracted about 20 inches before it started to expand. So that's really how I got into uh, uh, infrared, because uh, then uh, I went to Norman Shepard one day, and I said, look, I have this problem with porous glass, and the ammonia's doing all sorts of weird things. Can't figure out what the hell is happening. Can infrared help us? So Norman Shepard said, oh, well, yes, lots of people have asked me if we can do it on surfaces, but it's not that easy because you need a relatively large amount. Infrared isn't that sensitive. So he said, uh, so I said, fine, so I'll do a calculation of what, how thick a monolayer is when you put it through two walls of porous glass, when the walls of the porous glass are about a couple of millimeters thick. Uh, I forget what the number it worked out to be, something in the order of uh, 50, probably 50 microns. So they said, that's plenty. So. That's how we got started, and I designed the infrared cell, and that's how we got started. And I guess the main thing I did with Shepard was uh, absorbing um, methane at uh, 90 degrees, 90 Kelvin. We also absorbed hydrogen at 90 Kelvin. <coughs> and hydrogen was sort of an interesting tour de force because uh, hydrogen has no infrared spectrum because it's a diatomic molecule. With, uh, and of course, the only the only <coughs> transitions which are active in the infrared are if you've got um, essentially a dipole change. So when you carbon and oxide and the carbon and oxygen go apart and move apart, you've got the dipole change. In the case of nitrogen, clearly the uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, or hydrogen, clearly there isn't any. But um, it would be known for a long time, or should I say, considered for a long time, that surfaces are very high electrostatic field of the surface. It so happened that uh, I found a paper where somebody had done uh, very interesting work on, um, they were just pure spectroscopists, they just done some very interesting work on um, hydrogen at high pressures. And they found that it in, in, induced uh, infrared activity. And uh, furthermore, they calibrated it so we knew exactly what intensity of band to expect for the given voltage. So all we had to do was to measure the, we knew the coverage of the hydrogen on the porous glass. So all we had to do was uh, put that back in and we could calculate right away the voltage of the surface. As far as I know, that's the only time it's ever been done to this day. It's, I forget what it was, but it, it's, well, and of course, the interesting thing is, of course, that the voltage falls off very rapidly from the surface. So with this experiment, you don't need to know the distance because this is just an average distance of a hydrogen molecule finds itself on the surface, which is, of course, the same distance as any other molecule of similar size. So it was quite interesting. So do you, do you want to enter in the discussion, or do you just want me to keep going? I just, I, I write down questions. So. Oh, OK. Um, do you mean that you'll ask, you'll ask the questions at the end, you mean? Yeah, or whenever there's a break. Yeah. Or, I, but since we got one, uh, since what? You, you, the uh, first international congress on catalysis, uh, if I remember, you had a paper on the expansion of glass. Yeah, that's what it was, yeah. I gave a paper on it, yeah. Uh, were you already at Exxon then? Or, well, oh, no, no. At, so, uh, then, so then I got my PhD in uh, Cambridge in 1955 and stayed on with a, uh, a fellowship from the British Ceramic Research till 1958. And the reason I left Cambridge was because uh, Jack Schulman, who was my supervisor, got a, a chair from International Nickel at uh, Columbia University. So he went there and I followed him six months later. And uh, that was 1958. Oh, yeah, we're getting out of sequence here. So the first time I think I came to America was and I was invited to go to the Gordon Conference, uh, which I went there with Al Zettelmeyer and spent, uh, let me see, I don't remember, six weeks, I think, at Lehigh. Then I was six weeks with, uh, at uh, Pittsburgh trying to do infrared, uh, trying to do actually NMR of absorbed ammonia, uh, which we uh, found very difficult because the bands are very broad. Then I uh, came over to the States again in 1956 at the first International Congress on Catalysis, and I gave a paper on uh, uh, length change, and I think dichlorothane, if I remember. 
So that was, a, you know, an extension of the life change work I'd done. Then I came to uh, Columbia in 1958 and spent a couple of years there with uh, Jack Schulman and published a couple of papers on uh, infrared, mostly on, uh, what do we think? One was on pure titanium dioxide, and there's a, cover, a couple others with O'Neill on uh, nickel on silica, I remember. And then uh, during that time, I was consultant with Exxon during the summer. Then I went back to the UK for a year at the National Physical Lab, which is the equivalent of NBS. And uh, then I got an offer from Exxon for full time there, so I came back. So I was started at Exxon about well, in November 1961, I guess. Then I was in Exxon then until 1986. <clears throat> so what do you want me to say about the Exxon there? Well, uh, how... how uh Sh what Shepherd School was like when you were there, and what what Shepherd, uh, and how large this group was, and uh, the, the training. And at the time when I first got there, I was you know I was um, I guess it was probably similar to the, about the time I finished my PhD, and uh, he he was in Department of College Science at that time, and uh, was some um, some sort of. I can't remember, some relatively unestablished position. It's very, very difficult to get tenure or anything even slightly permanent in Cambridge. It was then, I guess it still is. And, uh, he's, and then he, uh, I, he, I think he got an appointment in the chemistry department and stayed on in uh, Cambridge until, I don't know, sometime in the 1960s. Then he got a, a chair out of the New University of East Anglia and he lived there. And he had a relatively small group, three or four students. I, he had a couple of other students working with me who were doing their PhD at the time. Uh, and we published something with them. There was Les Little, who uh, went back to Australia eventually, and uh, also Charles Angel, who uh, I think ended up at um, yeah, Union Carbon. And uh, as I said, there when I went to Columbia, <coughs> I worked with uh, Charles O'Neill, who was, uh, I guess, sort of on leave of absence from International Nickel at that time. And uh, we just uh, weren't able to get too much done there in a couple of years. It took a while to get everything set up because you know, Shulman was just new there, so we didn't really have anything really set up. It was uh, pretty tough getting set up. So while I was uh, consulting uh, at Exxon during the summer, we got equipment and everything ready, so as soon as I moved to Exxon full-time, we got uh, rolling pretty fast and did a lot of uh, infrared stuff. So that was, gee, I don't know, have you got my uh, references? Uh, I think for the first, let's see, for the first, uh, I guess for the first two or three years when I went to Exxon, I worked pretty much entirely on infrared. And then at that time, uh, there was a, a problem where they were developing a nickel catalyst for I forget what process. Oh, I know what it was, they're developing a nickel catalyst for town gas. And then just about that time, it was, I guess in Europe, just about that time they discovered these phenomenally large methane gas fields in Harleth. So we didn't need town gas in a hurry. But anyway, uh, I guess that's one of the first patents anybody ever got uh, for a nickel catalyst where we specified the dispersion of the nickel. One of the parameters we got in the patent was uh, and I set up a whole system at that time to measure hydrogen chemical absorption. So that's how that got started, basically, with a, with a massive nickel catalyst we were working on for the town gas. So then, of course, uh, subsequent to that, I did a lot of uh, work with uh, uh, Taylor and Sinfeld. We practically uh, practically did every uh, known metal in the periodic table, I think, <laughs> as far as the... Uh, so we were able to get specific activity in, uh, you know, in, uh, in, I don't know how many papers we published, must have been a lot. 
That's the ethane hydrogenolysis. We must have published at least half a dozen papers on uh, ethane hydrogenolysis. And at that time, I was also working on, basically, on uh, infrared spectrum on alumina and also uh, uh, zeolites. Did quite a lot of work on zeolites. So, in addition to ethane, we also worked on cyclopropane and deuterium exchange on alumina. Quite a bit of work on the zeolites, including some work they're using a microbalance. Got the stability of metallic cations in zeolites. They found out if we got, uh, for instance, we got mercury in a zeolite and reduced it, the mercury came barreling out. And very, very easy to measure such things, but a, <coughs> but a sensitive microbalance, we're using a little. I guess the con microbiomes. So let me see. Yeah, so then we did some one uh, really uh, very uh, exhaustive piece of work on infrared, which I guess is uh, probably the first one that was done. We took uh, ethylene zeosorbate and took a whole uh, bunch of phagocyte zeolites, which are nowadays are pretty much known as 13X. And they were all ion exchange with a whole bunch of ions. Um, Probably sodium, of course, and uh, silver and uh, strontium, all sorts of things. We got very, very interesting and complicated infrared spectra, which we were able to interpret. And about that time, I also started working on the ESR with George Muha. We published a few papers on ESR with George Muha with gamma irradiated uh, high surface area silica, and he later went on to uh, Rutgers, where I guess he still is. So, then we continued on the uh, hydrogenolysis of ethane, and then we started working on uh, in the rhodium in great detail, where we varied the uh, dispersion of the rhodium to over a very, very wide range. In fact, we even did quite a bit of work on uh, uh, rhodium, uh, non, uh, rhodium not on the support, just rhodium black, basically. So, that was one of the best ones we did uh, with uh, Sinfo. That was a very uh, interesting work there. We did, we did the dispersion of the rhodium basically all the way from atomic dispersion at that time, which we didn't know the structure of, but we were, you know, the hydrogen chemist option was essentially saying it was 11 angstrom particles. And uh, all the way from, I forget what they were, 5, 10, Angstroms, or maybe even bigger, the unsupported value. So we studied the, uh, you know, the uh, hydrogenolysis of ethane over that whole range of particle size, and of course determined the specific activity. And I think all, and all that work that we did with Sinfo, I think we were one of the first, if not the first, people ever to determine specific activity of any catalyst. Uh, because before that, before we started working systematically with the uh, with the hydrogen chemist option, it was really very, very uh, little that had ever been done systematically to measure the dispersion of metals. I think there's some work by the Dutch group, Sky and Van Rijn, if I remember, in the uh, Shell Labs before that. But that was, and I, I think also, uh, yeah, a couple of years before we worked on it, I think uh, yeah, Boudart at um, at Exxon at that time, and I think another group. Can you remember the Kurt group at Shell? Adams and yeah, Adams Benassi, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a group at Shell. So at that time, both the, um, the group at Shell and Buddha basically measured the uh, uh, dispersion of platinum on lumina, which I guess was shown at that time to be basically <coughs> fully dispersed. And um, but. That pretty much was it, and I think they'd done some early Dutch work uh, on nickel catalysts, but uh, I think we were the first to really systematically use uh, uh, hydrogen, uh, well, and CO absorption as a measure of <coughs> dispersion in a really systematic way. So, um, and of course, uh, <coughs> so basically on, on this work, I was really developing the dispersion methods, and John was, uh, of course, responsible for all the catalytic work. So, 
that's really how that split up. So, let me see. So, what we did here was we also, at that time, in one of our early papers, <coughs> Systematically varied, for instance, in the case of nickel catalysts, we systematic, uh, systematically varied the metal loading level and showed uh, right along, right, that's, no, I guess on the second paper, we showed the effect of the support on the catalytic activity of nickel. So essentially, by, uh, I think at that time, I think we kept the loading constant, just simply changed the support. We went 10% nickel on cabosil, then 10% nickel on alumina, and then I think we put nickel on silicon over the also. And he found there was really a, quite a big variation in specific activity uh, when we changed the support, which of course, you know, could never have been done even remotely accurately in the past unless you just happened to be in the right particle size to do some sort of uh, x-ray line broadening, which isn't really very precise. <coughs> so uh, the first couple of papers were on nickel. Uh, so I guess, uh, let me see, then this one. Oh yeah, then, then I guess we did other metals then, probably cobalt, I can't remember that. It's just, you know, we're just from the tips here. Then we did cyclopropane with hydrogen over supported nickel. Then we did a, another complete paper on cobalt. Then we did more work on the cyclopropane with a, a series of metals. Probably uh, cobalt and uh, nickel. Uh, maybe noble metals. <clears throat> I can't remember, but you know, I've got all these papers at home, but so if you have any questions, I can always dig them out later. Uh, and then we did dilute nickel catalysts. Then I guess we kept the support constant and varied the concentration of nickels, for instance, 10, 5, or 1%. Then we found, of course, there was really big effect of the support then with the relatively low metal concentration. So then we did a whole bunch of noble metals. The, the title being the noble metals of group eight. Then we did a separate paper on the rhodium. That's the one where we had unsupported rhodium. Then we did, um, after later on in the group eight metals, we did osmium and iron. The osmium being uh, quite tricky to handle, of course. We had to be very careful what we're doing with osmium. You, you know this osmium is a big mm. safety problem? No. Well, osmium is a very interesting metal. Um, and the reason it's, uh, it, it's used extensively actually in, in, I guess, light microscopy, certainly in electron microscopy, because they use it to stain biological tissue. So you get any osmium in your eyes, forget it. It stains the cornea, and that's it. <laughs> actually, it's the oxide that's dangerous, osmium tetroxide. So as long as you've got the osmium in the metallic form, there's no problem. The handling problem is really a problem for us. And then I guess we uh, also did work on rhenium and iridium and platinum and all the noble metals. And uh, <coughs> then we uh, finally were working on uh, molybdenum, and that was uh, very interesting. We couldn't figure out what in the hell was happening. And basically, we couldn't, we ended up not being able to get any data on molybdenum. <coughs> because what happened was during the catalytic reaction, we found out we were we were making molybdenum carbon. So there's no way we could study the reaction of that thing over molybdenum, so we published a short paper on the carbiding activity of the molybdenum, which just sort of surprised us. <coughs> and let's see, about that time, that's when I did uh, that very, uh, I don't know if you remember, remember the paper I did with uh, the rhodium? Uh, the raft? Well, no, before that, with the electron microscope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was around 1971. That's when working with Eddie Prestridge, we used the same uh, catalyst that we'd used in the, in the uh, catalytic process. That was, as far as I remember, it was 10%. Yeah, 10% rhodium on silica reduced to low temperature. Uh, we didn't know at that time. Well, actually, you don't get the rafts as much with the, with the silica, but. We couldn't actually do much effective electron microscopy on alumina because with a lot of interference with the structure of the support. So, uh, so uh, what we did with it was a really uh, high quality Phillips uh, TEM. And 
Ed had this developed this very nice technique for really getting the, you know pushing as much as possible out of the microscope, and in fact got the microscope to a point where you actually could not see the resolution that we got on the phosphorescent screen. You have you ever done electron microscopy? A little bit. Yeah, so what you could see on the screen was not what we got. So what we did basically was to uh, have to focus through and back the sample and take a whole bunch of photographs. And then take the photographs and blow them up in the larger. Then that's how we got the resolution. So we could see a bunch of whole. It was essentially right. We got a bunch of whole six rhodium atoms in a circle. Now, of course, with an electron microscope, you have no idea if one atom is sitting on top of the other or not. So, of course, this was the one that we'd already uh, done all the chemisorption on and uh, understood pretty thoroughly. It was the one that uh, we published the hydrogenolysis with Sinfeld. So, we knew that it was essentially atomically dispersed in the sense that atomically dispersed now being defined as one hydrogen atom or one CO atom per CO molecule per rhodium atom in the sample because we of course knew the metallic content. So because we knew it was one-to-one -one chemisorption and then we, once we got the electron microscope we knew there had to be a raft, there wasn't any other way, so they, there couldn't be two rafts sitting together and the picture looked essentially like a benzene ring sitting on the, on the cabosyl surface. So that was the little letter was seen in uh, Nature. Did you see that one, uh, Bert? Or not? Yes. Yeah. Then after that, I guess shortly after that, uh, we, together with Carter, uh, uh, John Sinfeld and I started working on copper nickel alloys. And that was a very interesting uh, work because it, the, we tried to get the, well, we did get the composition of the alloys basically from hydrogen chemisorption. And these were unsupported alloys. So it, would, it was too complicated to use a support. So we were, I guess it was some old technique. I think Keith Hall and uh, Emmett used something like that. What we would do is we'd take uh, mixtures of nickel and copper nitrate and precipitate them out with ammonium hydroxide or something like that. So they would end up with a mixed oxides, then reduce them at low temperatures, which was quite fun because after we reduced them, they were pretty damn pyrophonic. <laughs> So then we had to passivate them before we could take them out, and I'd put them in my, you know, uh, chemisorption system, and of course then we would also put some in the, in the catalyst system, and we'd, we would reduce them with identical procedures. But that was very interesting from a chemisorption point of view, of course, because, you know, we could measure the total area on these powders very easily with argon or nitrogen BET, so we could compare directly the chemisorption with. Uh, you know, with a, with a total surface area. And I remember the, uh, uh, that time a lot of people claimed you couldn't absorb hydrogen on copper. We did get some absorption of hydrogen on copper, but it's very, very different than on nickel. So uh, <clears throat> the copper, the hydrogen on nickel gives a normal chemisorption isotherm with it. But the coppers are much more reversible, so the technique we basically used was to uh, do an isotherm, pump it off for some arbitrary time of the order of five minutes, <clears throat> and then reabsorb. Do a second isotherm on top of just after pumping at room temperature for five minutes. And in the case of nickel, on the reabsorption, you wouldn't you basically would absorb nothing because the hydrogen was so strongly absorbed it wouldn't come off in a mm -hmm. five minute pumping. And in the case of copper, pure copper, the second isotherm would be like the first pretty close because they essentially would all come off on the first isotherm. So therefore from this we were able to find out very easily that for instance we put 5% copper in the catalyst but uh, boy it uh, was mostly copper in the surface. So that was uh, I think one of the very interesting paper where we, uh, so I guess it's got quite a bit of attention since then because I guess it was the first one that anybody had ever done I think on alloys that were reasonably well defined. So that's about the one paper I did uh, published on the uh, copper nickel alloys. I also did a lot of work uh, which was never published on the, because I was all involved in the development of the platinum iridium catalyst about that time. It started about that time. Uh, what I did mostly on the platinum iridium catalyst was to work out the techniques for redispersion. Uh, you ever seen any of those papers, uh, patents, Bert? Uh, not 
the details, no. I, so you can, uh, I guess I didn't, uh, well, I, everybody has a different philosophy on patents, but all my patents are written like a paper in the sense that uh, I wrote every single one of the examples and it's really got data in all my patents just like a regular paper. <laughs> And the lawyers are at the beginning and they've caused all the claims. So, if, if you want to know how to redisperse platinum iridium catalysts, all you have to do is to read my patents. That was a, my main contribution I did on the... Uh, um, now, why did Exxon decide to develop their own catalyst instead of platinum rhenium? Or? Well, this was almost before platinum rhenium. Oh. We were, we were a little ahead of Platinum Rhenium. Well, it, it, it had a lot of, it, it, a lot of advantages, and uh, it was a little tricky on startup, though. Other people had, been, had used uh, Iridium Catalyst. We heard uh, all sorts of things through the grapevine that somebody's, you know, I think it was in a refinery in Italy someplace, somebody put a fairly diluted Iridium Catalyst in. But Iridium Catalysts are so active when you first start them up, that these people didn't have any idea how to start up the catalyst. And uh, they got this unbelievable temperature surge when they put the feed in, <laughs> melted all the aluminum into one block. <laughs> so a lot of the tricks of this catalyst are how the hell to handle it and get it on oil and avoid big, big exotherms and so on. But it's a very active catalyst. Uh, it has some limitations, of course, due to the fact that there ain't that much iridium in the world. So it wasn't uh, used throughout the whole of the Exxon circuit by any means. The uh, rhenium was another matter. Do you, do you know how they get rhenium, uh, Bert, where rhenium came from? No, I don't. Oh, that's a very interesting story. So the rhenium, ca I don't remember who developed the rhenium catalyst. Remember, was it it's Chevron. Chevron, yeah. Well, rhenium, you know, was never discovered until 1932. Did you know that? by some, I think they were German or Hungarian chemists, Egert and Nodak or somebody. And anyway, when they first started making rhenium catalysts, I don't know, you know, really from Chevron's point of view, but uh, I do remember that at the time when they first started that, there was only one source of rhenium, and that was the stack of molybdenum smelter. They had to go down, <laughs> scrape, the, <laughs> scrape the chimney of molybdenum smelter. But, Rhenium in general, though was not known until 1932 as a relatively obscure element, is actually, there's plenty of it around in the world. And that was, of course, the big advantage of platinum rhenium over platinum iridium. And of course, once they got a reasonable amount going, when you rework the catalyst, then you've got a big source of iridium from re of rhenium for reworking to recycle back into the rhenium. But I don't know what the history of that catalyst is since I left Exxon, but it was still using it commercially when I left. Now, how difficult was it to get it from research to the plant? Oh, that actually worked pretty well. It really wasn't a big problem, basically enough. But we did, you know, a tremendous amount of pilot plant work around the clock for, you know, you'd have to run those sort of things. Damn, I think, as far as I remember, you'd have to run two or three, two or three months runs to get me data. <laughs> <laughs> because it took a while to settle down after you first went on oil. Uh, so, it, you know, apart from uh, developing the startup technique, it, uh, it was basically relatively easy uh, to get going in the plant. You basically took out a platinum catalyst and just put the platinum iridium on. The, the, the biggest difficulty with the, with the platinum iridium catalyst was it's a lot, a lot more sensitive, to, a lot easier to sint of the uh, iridium than it is than the platinum. So you had to be very careful on uh, coke burns and so on. Mm. Can we uh, switch her off? Let me take a little break here. Yeah. To uh, when we pretty much got the uh, platinum iridium catalyst uh, commercialized, I started working on uh, with Larry Morell on different methods of making catalysts. We worked on ruthenium and magnesium oxide, which at the time uh, I can't remember the application, but it was uh, interest in that catalyst. We uh, published that in the Preparation of Catalyst uh, Conference in, uh, in Brussels. Then after that, we uh, took a long while trying to interpret all the damn data. That's when we did the rhodium wraps. Uh, did you read that paper? 
and that's I guess one of the few infrared papers where we use chemisorption and electron microscopy as well. So I think we pretty much uh, proved we had two-dimensional rafts in there. And then also at that time, and then I published a, another, well, I had an invitation to a conference in uh, France, and we published, because uh, that one, yeah, we published that in uh, Growth and Properties of Metal Clusters at a conference in Lyon, and at that time we suggested that what happens when the CO absorbs on the rhodium rafts is the strength of absorption of the CO and the rhodium is so large that actually what happens is that the rafts expand. And that's why, because that was a, some controversy between uh, J.T. Yates and myself, because he interpreted the fact that as you absorb CO on these systems and increase the coverage, you would expect there to be a change in frequency of the CO due to lateral interactions. So he interpreted the fact that there wasn't any change in the frequency as due to the could be due to the fact there was single isolated rhodium atoms, which I never believe because it's against any sort of common sense that you know of preparation of catalysts. So the, in fact, I think it was later proved by the Dutch people using XAPs that we were right. So when the, when the CO absorbs on the, on the wraps, the rhodium wrap, the rhodium atoms move apart so you don't see the lateral interactions. Uh, let me see. So sometime after that, let's see. Yeah, sometime after that, I got interested in uh, in uh, deposition of carbon on uh, on metal surfaces, and published a paper with uh, Terry Baker and Jim Domestic on the uh, iron on filamentous uh, formation of filamentous carbon. I guess that's, that was uh, basically when we uh, found out, it was a byproduct of another investigation that uh, we found out that FEO was a very, very active catalyst for the formation of carbon. In fact, uh, later on we got a patent on that. Uh, what we found out was that nobody had ever made FEO at temperatures below a thousand. We sort of made it like, as far as I'm concerned, most of these times things happen serendipitously. <laughs> so we accidentally basically made FeO, which is a relatively obscure form of iron oxide and is normally only made at temperatures way above a thousand centigrade. So uh, believe it or not, we discovered without the slightest difficulty we could make FeO at 700 centigrade at quite, a quite fast rate and uh, just simply by passing steam over iron. ever found FEO and how many people have passed steam over <laughs> iron. But it's very simple because why it happened, because what we were doing, we were using iron, very small, uh, narrow iron foil, say five thousandths of an inch thick, two centimeters long, two or three millimeters wide. And as we found out from using Auger, as you know, I'm uh, not one for pushing surface science, but for Auger is an analytic. OJ is an analytical tool that's very interesting. OJ to tell you something about catalysis, in my opinion, is a zero, because you've <laughs> got to have an ultra-high vacuum. So what we found was that uh, doing an OJ analysis, uh, we could, by uh, bombarding with argon, we soon found out that we were getting pretty uniformly FEO all the way through the foils. And what we found out, we were sort of just lucky. The first time we did it, we stopped the reaction before it went to the middle, because what we found out eventually was that if you left, took this piece of foil in the steam and left it essentially for, to infinity, it turned entirely to Fe3 or 4. And we still don't understand this. It's absolutely, to my mind, it's absolutely wild. So what happens is you take a piece of iron, you put it in the steam, any temperature is above 540, and it's a, I don't know if you were, Heard me I guess you, I don't know, did you hear me give the paper at the First International Congress on Catalysis? Well, anyway, with this... I probably did, but don't remember. Hot, well, in, in Atlantic City. Right. No, it was not. No. Nope. Oh, Baltimore. Baltimore, wasn't it? Baltimore? I thought it was Baltimore. 
You, you mean North American or the? No, 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 the International Congress on Catalysis. Oh, it was in Philadelphia. No, oh, I Philadelphia. wasn't there. Oh, no. Oh. Anyway, because fundamentally, what I came to the conclusion with this uh, volume expansion of porous glass was that uh, thermodynamics, which is you know, obviously a cornerstone to most people's education, when it comes to thermodynamics of surfaces, it's a whole different story. And the thermodynamics applied to surfaces is very difficult, and a lot of the times it's completely wrong. Thermodynamics applies to bulk things, it applies to systems that are in equilibrium, and with, with surface processes you never really know if you're in equilibrium. But anyway, so one of the few times I ever paid attention to, to thermodynamics was when we were working on this FEO, because we found out the phase diagram, which of course is well established, shows that FEO is unstable below 540 centigrade, and uh, basically looks as though it shouldn't exist if you try to make it below 540 centigrade, and that's what we found with the OJ. We, we took the, uh, originally we were working at 700 centigrade and we got pretty fast reaction. So we went down to 500 centigrade and we found as we bombarded with the OJ that the composition changed as we went down into the, into the foil. We're talking about a couple of thousand angstrom. So then we went to 560 centigrade and then the composition was absolutely constant. We made FEO at 560 centigrade. Uh, this work was actually uh, then published shortly after I left Exxon. It was published in Inorganic Chemistry, which I'm sure nobody in the catalyst, <laughs> nobody, nobody in the catalyst constituency is ever going to read. But it was uh, quite amazing stuff, and uh, the these crist and the the way these materials grew was absolutely incredible. When you when you took out the iron foil after you treated it with the steam. The, uh, the whole surface was, was, it looked like a whole surface was made of diamonds. And we looked at this thing in the SEM and you never saw anything like it in your life. We have a, unfortunately we were only able to get a couple of pictures in the, in, in the article, but it's just incredible structures like spikes and triangles and cubes and steps everywhere. They were just extremely beautiful crystals. So uh, we were able to get a patent on it. We had a hard time. We were trying to get composite. With, I guess we were trying to get composition of matter, but the patent office, as you know, does not like to give composition of matter patents. But the only way we could get a patent, uh, well, let me go back to how, how this, what happens mechanistically. So what we, dis we also did a lot of x-ray work on this. And we could, we could take these, because if you wanted to really look all the way down, the OGE is much too slow. So we, take the x -ray, we would take these things, and scrape the stuff off, if there was still intact foil inside because the FEO is brittle and foil, of course, is ductile. They would scrape it off and take an average in the X-ray so we could see if it was from the X-ray, but it was FEO, FEO was well known in the X-ray. So we could see if it was a mixture of FEO and FE304 or whatever. So uh, what we showed was that as, as you kept treating, what we finally what we ended up with was to take a whole bunch of iron foils of different thicknesses and put them in the reactor and heat them all together. So then, the, for instance, the 50 uh, micron foil would be overreacted and the 100 micron foil might be just about reacted to the middle and the 300 one would be over. In fact, we showed that it didn't make any difference whether you use pure iron or mild steel or anything. It's, it's just a process of iron. But what seems to happen is that you get FEO form starts from the outside and just goes, the reaction goes, the FEO gets thicker and thicker and moves towards the middle. And we still don't, still can never figure out why. When it gets to the middle, it knows. Because then it starts to form Fe304 on the outside. Can you believe it? And then the whole thing, at infinite time, the whole thing converts to Fe304. Translation, if you did this, Without the OJ, without knowing what you were doing, and left it in too long, you would never find FEO. Mm -hmm. So we were able to get a very, uh, well, the patent examiner finally allowed to have a patent with only very strict geometrical restrictions. In other words, if you take iron powder, which by definition has a Gaussian distribution of particle sizes, and you treat that for X hours at 700 centigrade, the big particles are still going to be FeO on the outside with Fe on the inside, and the small particles are Fe304. Mm -hmm. 
So we've got a patent for foils and rods and uh, gauze, I guess. That's it. So but it's a pretty interesting process, but it's an extremely active catalyst to make it filamentous carbon. And that's where we published to Terry Bacon. We think there what happens is during the carbon formation, the FEO gets, because it's, uh, I don't know if you know, but FEO is uh, one of these compounds that doesn't want to be. In other words, Fe203 and Fe304 really wants to be Fe203 and Fe304. They're very stable and very stoichiometric. FEO is extremely non-stoichiometric. It doesn't, it's very difficult to make it really pure. <laughs> so what seems to happen is when you start to reduce the, uh, the iron, then you get a very, very poor structure. This thing uh, will give, for instance, it's far more active than pure iron as far as making filamentous carbon is concerned. So uh, then after I left Exxon, I did a little bit of uh, work down at Rutgers, and uh, just before I left Exxon, I'd started working on uh, uh, oxidative dehydrogenation of methane and uh, published uh, uh, and, and at the time, my wife was working at Lafayette, and, uh, which is a little uh, teaching college in Eastern PA. So I did uh, some research there for, for a year, about a couple of years with her to finish off the work we were doing before and published a couple of papers. She also published a paper on lithium tetraborate as a catalyst for dehydrogenation. So that's about it. Well, what was Exxon like when you joined them? in research. In what way? Oh, uh, w were, was it long-term research? Uh, yeah, the, yeah, I would say at that time they were, yeah, they were, well, let's put it this way, they were pretty much doing a mix of, uh, of uh, you know, at the time we were publishing all these uh, papers uh, with John, we were sure working on commercial stuff at the same time, yes. So it was a mix of, uh, well, I would, it wasn't really that short term either, but it was a mix of commercial work and, and basic work. So we had pretty good freedom for doing basic work for quite a while. Well, it, it seemed to me that uh, Mobile was concentrating on zeolites and a Exxon did much more on the metals. Was that... Well, that's true, but also before we started, actually a long while, I. Pretty much before I started with Exxon, they they did a lot of work in zeolites of Baton Rouge, but they weren't doing much work up in uh, New Jersey. But I did some work on zeolites myself, but it was uh, it was pretty much all basic. We didn't do any development. Mm -hmm. I don't think we synthesized any new catalyst down in Baton Rouge. But uh, Mobile was, you know, very very heavily into uh, synthesis and development of new zeolites. No, we didn't. No, it was quite a bit of work at Exxon. Of the zeolites, but I, I don't know. I think they discontinued that a few years after I went to Exxon. But they did they did quite a bit of work with zeolites. And, uh, what was the biggest change that you saw in research while you were at Exxon? Well, you know, apart from the usual infinite number of rearrangements, <laughs> like any organization. Well, it wasn't really. When I first went to Exxon, we, we were, I was in the, the process research division. At that time, we had, uh, we actually used space that was actually in office buildings in the, in the, actually in the Bayway refinery. And then after that, we moved over to the research center and they uh, organized, I guess, what they called it, uh, CBRL, Central Basic Research, which was over in, uh, which was over, over the road in, uh, also in Linden. Then, of course, towards the end, we moved out to, to uh, Clinton. But I think on the whole, uh, overall, they maintained a pretty stable environment. And uh, uh, overall, I would say they were a pretty good research organization. We, didn't have a, we never had much problems with equipment. We could always get equipment we wanted. And uh, we always, when I was doing the OJ work, we always had good access to well, I guess there was probably even half a dozen people just using this, this scanning OJ, which cost half a million. So. We had very well equipped, I would say, with an apparatus. So. Uh, how did you come to read these papers by, uh, and I can't pronounce his name right, uh, 
Bonham or oh Bangham. Bangham. Yeah, that was in the, when I was working at the ceramic research in, in the UK, working on pottery. I don't know. I guess I was looking into this uh, so-called what they call this. Uh, there's a problem in uh, porous pottery, which they uh, make in the UK, the cheapest style of pottery. It's not, it's not fired to a high temperature like porcelain is, and it still retains quite a little porosity when the, you know, when it's after it's been finally fired. And then, of course, as you know, all uh, pottery, at least that you eat from, is all glazed, which is basically just a low melting point glass that's put mm -hmm. on top of the uh, pottery and is uh, then fired separately. And what they found is there's a practical problem is that, uh, you know, with time, you'd either develop holes in the glaze or whatever, uh, or defects or chips or whatever, and the water would diffuse, obviously, all. <laughs> trying to get some water a hell of a lot. So the water would diffuse in through the, uh, through the glaze. And then the, you know, the subsequent under, underlying porous material would expand. I mean, very tiny amount, but you don't need to expand much to crack a glaze some more. So then the glaze would crack some more and more water would get in. So uh, that's how I got out. That's how I found out. I don't remember how, but that's how I found out about the, the uh, carbon but uh, as I said, I guess it was a somewhat unusual situation. I uh, developed a problem I'd want to work on and designed the equipment and everything else and sent it down to Cambridge. This is, this is my idea, this is what I want to work on. I did my own thesis. Nobody told me anything what to do. In fact, I was absolutely on my own because the supervisor with uh, Jack Shulman, who was uh, very good in getting me support to work on this, uh, he, as I said, he was a... Uh, he was a you know real color chemist, uh, Langley or Blodgett type of thing, and uh, basically liquid uh, aqueous based colloids, and uh, was also uh, doing a lot of work on uh, flotation for ores, and uh, in fact they were supported from the, the Ernest Oppenheimer fund, which is the, the well-known diamond uh, monopoly, I guess. Cause I guess uh, clearly uh, I don't know if you know, but that's how they separate diamonds from soil is basically a flotation method. Because the diamonds stick to grease and the soil doesn't. A lot of ores are like that. They also, he also got money, I think, from a copper company. It was a, no, I guess it was a, it was a zinc company. Yeah. Because that's why they were interested in cadmium, because zinc and cadmium occur together. And the copper and the zinc are all, all separated by flotation processes. So which, of course, is basically aqueous systems with, uh, you know, particles of the minerals. Mm -hmm. So the aim of the game is to separate the minerals from, uh, you know, the soil and the rock and everything else. So he was not, uh, uh, you know, really did very little in the uh, solid gas interface. So I was about the only guy working on that. During the Second World War, were you in London or that area? Or? No, no. I, I was born in uh, Staffordshire, so I was up in uh, high school at that time in Staffordshire. So I didn't get, didn't get bombed much. Well, I guess we got bombed once, but that was about it. So we uh, didn't feel the effect of the war like London, that's for sure. <laughs> I, was school pretty much normal during that time? Or? Oh, yeah. So? Yeah, I went to university right after World War Two. So they pretty much got, during the war, I think they shortened the degree courses, but after the war we went back to the normal British, which is three years for an degree. So I took, uh, you know, it's much more, uh, what should I say, structured than American universities. So I took uh, physics as my major and took, uh, let me see, physical chemistry and some inorganic chemistry, uh, as subsidiary with, a lot, well, of course, a lot of mathematics. Then I went to, because I was interested in the latent image, so I went to Kodak for a couple of years and did research on the latent image, because I've always been interested in photography. Oh, that takes care of my questions. Uh. Okay, no, good. Thanks. So, uh, 
The only other thing I didn't discuss in much detail because uh, unfortunately it never, we were never able to patent it. Uh, I developed a CVD process to stop uh, carbon growing on metal surfaces. In fact, it got scaled up and tested, but well, for one reason, you know how tricky patents are. We just, there was other patents not. We found out after we started on this thing with similar processes, but with a different. Uh, they were a different. Um, what shall I say? A different molecule they were using to make these films. The problem was that uh, overall the process wasn't that different. We were using a different molecule which had a lot of advantages. But nevertheless, we'd had one hell of a time to really get a patent to overcome this other patent. And in the meantime, we'd disclose every damn thing we were doing. <laughs> so they never patented it. Plus, it was an application for uh, part of the uh, part of Exxon that was uh, how shall I put it? Uh, much less, uh, much less keen on patents than most of the organisations. They were much keener on keeping things quiet. <laughs> so we're never able to publish. Never even able to publish anything, unfortunately. Because it was, uh, oh, I don't know. Three or four years' work, and I started the whole project by myself, and it, we got right through into a big scale up into a plant. Unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, Work the way it was supposed to, but you know it's a very difficult interface to build. There's a re there's a real interface. That you can if you're going to go from the research lab into the refinery with something that's absolutely new, <laughs> commercializing platinum iridium, you took out a platinum catalyst and you put in the platinum iridium catalyst. But that almost literally was it. I mean, you know, the catalyst was a very different to handle. The startup procedure was different. The uh, burn procedure, the regeneration procedure, all these things were different. But, you know, you could use existing reactors, you could use existing equipment, it's basically, what do they call that, turnkey or something? Mm -hmm. So that was turnkey, see, what I got was completely new and it wasn't turnkey. If you try commercializing that, and that's when real trouble hits. So, that's the way the world is, I guess. What's the biggest changes you've seen in research from when you started till now? Oh, I guess it's fermentation, basically. So much more than when I started work. There was indeed many such things, for instance, an OJ spectrometer. Are you uh, at all familiar with these techniques? Hmm. Well, I, you know, all of the, uh, Pierre Auger showed these uh, transitions in, I don't know, 1925? It was around that time, I don't remember Until exactly. Had modern electronics, you couldn't do a damn thing with it. It was just a, you know, a, a physicist curiosity. So you've got to have ultra-high ultra high vacuum, but, uh, you know, you're talking about, I don't know, God, to the minus 16 of an amp or something ridiculous. So, Electronics is absent, and uh, the electron beam and everything else is all you know, completely uh, couldn't be done to, I don't know, what, 10, 15 years ago. And the same with NMR. We tried to do a lot of work with NMR. The job species but proved to be much, much less useful than infrared. Mm -hmm. Did you go to Gabor's talk the other day? No, I didn't. He and others, he's not the only one, of course, who played with, uh, how should we call it, surface science contributed to the development of catalysts, <laughs> which, as far as I'm concerned, is not exactly correct. And uh, I was having a big discussion with somebody over the last couple of days, and I guess my position is this. If you've got a technique where you can have the gas there, then that's useful for catalysis, particularly, uh, for instance, infrared and X-ray in the various forms of modern X-ray, such as X-apps and X-apps or whatever. X-ray, of course, is a bulk technique. Mm -hmm. By no means is the surface sensitive and basically the same with infrared. So the only way you get surface information is by having very highly dispersed systems. Uh, Techniques like that, and for instance, the new scanning probe microscope, because that can be used at pressure. And uh, do you know Terry Baker? Right. Yeah. 
So, you know, his development of the electron microscope, having a, a cell where you could have finite pressure in there. But techniques such as Auger and LEAD and uh, all the other, uh, you know, uh, alphabet and all these other techniques. That when you've got systems in ultra high vacuum, you can't study anything that's relevant to catalysis and might. You could get some information that might be applicable. But you can only study things that are very, very strongly absorbed, like CO1 platinum. Oh, I guess I didn't discuss, didn't discuss my gold paper. That was a paper that got well and truly buried. How was this? This was, I guess, for a fresh shift for Schumer when he died. Did you ever see my gold paper? I've seen the gold paper, but uh, I, I don't remember the oh, detail. Okay. Well, what was interesting about that was that I could do, uh, I could make the gold would make CO2 very readily at room temperature. But, but the uh, CO, I couldn't get any information really on how strongly the oxygen was absorbed. But for instance, you could put oxygen in, pump it out, and then put in CO, and you wouldn't make any CO2. And the CO on gold it would essentially be pumped out in a minute. So that was also very, very good to itself. But you put these two gases together, for instance, put five centimeters of CO in the infrared cell and then put six centimeters of oxygen on the other side of the stopcock and open the stopcock, then it would make CO2 like crazy. It didn't make any difference which, which order you added the CO and the oxygen. And uh, that's, as uh, far as I know, probably a bestified example of catalysis being with unbelievably weakly chemical species, and this is a perfect example of systems you couldn't possibly study in the vacuum conditions. It's also interesting with the contrast with platinum, because if you take, do the same thing with supported platinum catalyst, and you add oxygen to it and then pump out the uh, gaseous oxygen, the, uh, it's of course well known that the oxygen stays behind at least a one way, maybe a little more. And then if you and pump that out as hard as you want, as long as you want, it's still going to get a monolayer of oxygen stage there. And then you add an excess of CO. <coughs> That'll make CO2 with the oxygen that's absorbed. <coughs> but if you do it the other way, <coughs> take clean platinum and add CO to it, mm -hmm. and then add oxygen at all the room temperature, you get almost no reaction at all, because the CO is much too strongly held. And as you know, uh, basically all catalysis takes place in weakly absorbed species almost by definition, but if they're strongly absorbed, they're a poison. Whether it's a one of the catalytic partners or not. In other words, if you want to use platinum to do CO2 oxidation, CO oxidation, you better be careful not to have too much platinum in there, uh, too much CO in the mixture, else you come to a grinding hole. So that's, uh, I guess, my comment on the utility of surface physics and surface chemistry. That's why I like to differentiate surface physics. I like to think of surface physics of these techniques where they have to use a hard vacuum. <laughs> and anything else I prefer to call surface chemistry. And, uh, <coughs> as you know, many people make claims to these techniques as far as being the utility of catalysis. <laughs> but uh, you know, anybody who's ever developed a catalyst knows that's not true. But, you know, other things are very useful, like XAPs. Of course, the hydrogen can absorption is the only accurate way to measure dispersion. Now, of course, there was a lot of work people tried to do, uh, where well, you still can measure some average particle size from you know, live boarding and X-rays, but it's relatively limited. In the, it certainly doesn't work at all 50 angstroms, and uh, it's, it's just not as accurate as can absorption. So, what? I guess that's it. I don't have any more.